sermon. I told you my granddaughter, one of our granddaughters, gave me a, a calendar of, of jokes. And uh, here's one. The best present to give your grandchild is a broken drum. You can't beat that. <laughs> or did you hear about the anxious seamstress? She's on pins and needles. <laughs> Big sale on rowing paddles at my local shop. It's quite an ordeal. <laughs> Two more. <laughs> Who said really? <laughs> I got to keep that one. Um, Alan, you'll like this one. Civil War jokes. I generally don't like them. And broken guitar for sale. No strings attached. Pam thinks I laugh at my jokes so she can be enjoy my pleasure at my jokes. But that's not true. I laugh at my jokes because I think I'm incredibly funny, regardless of what you think. Have a new book out. I'm not writing fast. I started this about a year ago. Kingdom Abundance, Unlocking Heaven's Mindset on Finances. And uh, I can't afford to give them away this time, but... They're $15. Anybody that wants one, you can have them for 10 And I'll have a few up here the next few weeks. want to preach, and I'm not really preaching on Daniel today, but I'm calling it Daniel number three, as you think in your heart. Say that after me, as I think in my heart. It's really important if you control your thoughts... You'll control your mood, your character, and outcomes. And I want you to let that sink in. Control your thoughts to control your mood, your character, and outcomes. In the home, classroom, church, workplace, and society, some people stand above all the rest, just like Daniel and his friends did. What makes it so? It's not looks, giftedness, riches, talents. It does not matter how easy or difficult one's life is. Number one, if you're taking notes, it's how we look at things, which is based on character that is tempered by attitudes which are shaped by our thought life. Let me say it again. It's how we look at things, which is based on our character that is tempered by attitudes which are shaped by our thought life. Though Daniel joins Jesus, Abraham, Caleb, Ruth, Esther, Peter, and Paul as biblical examples of those who stood tall among their peers, our main text today is not from the book of Daniel. Last week I could not overlook the deep sorrow, heaviness, and depression, hopelessness I felt among our people. I felt some of it myself. I was bone tired, didn't feel good, my voice was weak, my stamina was waning. I knew I'd soon be better. But I said, Lord, what do you have to offer to renew everyone's hope and joy? This week's sermon was on my mind um, Sunday afternoon. And I kept saying, Lord, what do we get? What do I share that will help our people? And I didn't get to work on it until late Tuesday morning. But God was speaking. Number two, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We know that. But we have to embrace it. In Nehemiah chapter 8, the people gathered in the open square before the water gate. And the word of God was read to them from morning until midday. The people shouted amens and worshiped the Lord. But then the people began to weep, not because of the long sermon... Amen. But because things weren't what they used to be. Things weren't going as well. The temple, the wall wasn't as big and so on and so forth. And they began to weep. When we feel sorrow by the realization of our own sin or difficult circumstances, there's times we wonder, where am I going to get the strength 
to go on to get up tomorrow and keep on keeping on. And Nehemiah spoke to their need and urged them to move beyond their sorrow by changing their focus. And I need to encourage you with this one. With this message, there's people that are not here that need to hear this. People that are part of our church, people that are not. I will send you the text of it. You can send them to YouTube. But we need to break this hold, <coughs> excuse me, of sorrow and grief and heaviness. We need to bring it, break it. I can't remember who it was that said, I, I considered being a clergyman if most of the preachers I knew didn't look so much like funeral directors. Another man said, I... I I have a testimony. I left church today and I'm still not depressed. Something needs to change in our attitude and our focus. So Nehemiah said, and I'm just telling you, you can, you can pass this on and I pray that you will. Nehemiah said to them, This day is holy to the Lord. Do not mourn nor weep. And the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then again he said to them, This day is holy. Do not mourn or weep. That's from Nehemiah 1, 8, 1 to 8. But then ne Nehemiah 8, 10. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to the Lord. Do not sorrow. I'm not going to finish the word, the word yet. He said, I want you to leave church. I want you to have something good to eat. I want you to have something good to drink. And I want you to share that with other people because when you do that, something happens in you. You take your focus off your problems and you start to see somebody else's need and that changes your attitude. And then he finishes, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. We cannot find joy by focusing on everything that's wrong in our world. We don't find joy by counting our sorrows and naming them one by one. It escapes us if we focus on everything we have lost or might lose. Joy is listed second of the nine fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5.22. Though some believe that love, which is listed first, is the fruit of the Spirit, and joy through self-control are just manifestations of love. Whoever's right... Joy must be important because it's found in 192 verses in the Bible from Genesis through Jude. And I thought, well, why isn't it in Revelation? Because you don't need a fruit of joy when you're in the presence of Jesus. You just have joy. But think of David. Few people in the Bible endured more ups and downs, triumphs and sorrows than King David. He was a shepherd, a giant slayer, a folk hero, warrior, fugitive, exile, husband, father, and king. He saw it all. Yes, he also committed adultery with Sheba, Bathsheba. He lost his son. He lost his very best friend. Still in everything, David is referred to as a man after God's own heart. When times were tough, he cried out to God in frustration. When God was faithful, he lifted his voice in praise. He knew the heart of God, therefore, he knew his own heart. I want you to catch that. He knew the heart of God, therefore, he knew his own heart. To know the heart of God, Lord, let this sink in. Read Psalms. Today's March 20. Read Psalm 20, 50, 80, 110, 140. Tomorrow's the 21st. Read Psalm 21. 51, 81, 111, and 141. You just start with the day of the week and add 32. If you read the Psalms, you get to know the heart of God. And in doing so, you'll know your own heart. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Or that could be translated... The shout of joy comes in the morning. There's a song that we take from that psalm. You know what it is? Nobody? Trading my sorrows. There you go. Daryl Evans. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. 
I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. And we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. And he goes, I'm pressed but not crushed, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I'm blessed beyond the curse for his promise will endure, and his joy is going to be my strength. And then straight from Psalm 30, though the sorrow may last for the night, he comes... His joy comes in the morning. Will you trade your sorrows and your shame and lay them down for the joy of the Lord? Will you trade your sickness and your pain and lay them, lay them down for the Lord? Say it with me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord. Amen. I want you to make the, this decree after me. His joy is going to be my strength. Number three, you can say yes, Lord, if you change your thinking. Proverbs 23, 7a, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. If you think in your heart you're a sinner destined to fail, you will. But if you think in your heart you are a saint destined to victory, you will conquer. If you think in your heart no one loves you, you'll be unloved. But if you think in your heart everyone might as well love you because God does and you love others, you will be loved. If you think in your heart you are sick and will never get better, you probably won't. But if you think in your heart your sickness is passing and Jesus is your healer, you'll get better. If you think in your heart no one wants to be your friend, you won't have friends. But if you think in your heart you are a good friend, you'll have many friends. If you think in your heart things will never get better, they probably won't. But if you think in your heart God's bigger than your problems, you'll overcome them. If you think in your heart you're never going to get it, you'll never get it. But if you think in your heart you have the mind of Christ and with his help you'll figure it out, you will. If you think in your heart God doesn't care, you may not ever know how much he does care. But if you think in your heart God does care for me and he'll never leave me nor forsake me, you will say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. If you think in your heart I'm too stupid, too old, too unlucky, things will never change, you'll go through life with the same bad luck that has distressed you. But if you th think in your heart, give me that mountain, I'm more than able to conquer it, you will. If you think in your heart, I give up, things will never get better, they won't. But if you think in your heart, I will not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season I will reap my reward if I do not give up, you'll be rewarded. Do you see how your life rises and falls based on how you think? You are the greatest determiner in your life. God isn't, though he wants to lead you. Satan isn't, though he tries to be. You are the greater determ greatest determiner in your life. And your thinking determines how well it goes with you. You see, the battle is for the mind. The devil knows if he can sow doubt, depression, hopelessness, disease, victimization, etc. in your thinking, you will not believe but will be depressed, hopeless, sick, and victimized. Our granddaughter Ashley posted this. It was interesting. I just wrote that sick and victimized. Was getting ready to write number four, and she sent me the post. Do you know why birds sing just before dawn? Scientists believe it's to tell their mates that they made it through the night. It's a way of saying, I'm still here. Maybe that's why we sing too. Why we create art as a way of saying, I made it, I'm still here. Can you say that with me? I made it, I'm still here. Number four, steps to changing stinking thinking to optimistic faith. Optimistic faith raised Daniel far above his peers who were willing to compromise and re rather than remain true to their convictions. And everybody in his case, really everybody, has the same challenges. That's usually the case. 
But Daniel had to avoid compromise, tame the lions, and let God use him right where he was, smack dab in the middle of circumstances that crushed his peers. What was the difference? The way he thought. So steps to changing thinking, thinking. Letter A, step one, chose the focus of your thinking. Holy Spirit, who inspired David or whoever wrote Solomon, whoever wrote that particular proverb, Holy Spirit, who inspired, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he, also inspired Paul to write, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace be with you. Think on these things. God has a lot of gall, doesn't he? He thinks we must submit to him the way we think, to his ways that are higher than our ways. But we don't have to. We don't have to think the way he tells us to unless we want to change our stinking thinking to optimistic faith. Are you with me? Paul would have been overwhelmed by stinking thinking had he focused on how many shipwrecks he had, how many times he was stoned with actual stones, not addiction, thrown into prison for preaching the gospel, spent a night and a day in the sea, was in trouble by his own countrymen, by robbers, by murderers, had plots on his life, inclement weather and hostile crowd, and yet he maintained optimistic optimistic faith because he thought on these things that he wrote about in Philippians 4 8 and because he vic was victorious in this he said do what you've learned and received and heard and saw in me I've tried it I've struggled through it and now the God of peace will be with you just like he's with me change your thinking to change your joy level your peace level do you want the God of peace to be with you? Put to death your stinking thinking and focus on things above rather than things below. Father, we pause right now to pray. We need help in changing our stinking thinking, our bad attitudes, our everybody's out to give me, our, our nobody loves me. We need your help to transition us from stinking thinking to optimistic faith. Amen. Letter B. Step two, repent of your old way of thinking. And God led me to Acts 3.19 here, but I, I looked at several translations to find a few that would accurately convey the meaning of, true, of repentance. Too many people think repentance is going that way and meeting God and going that way. That is not repentance, that's reformation. Reformation is good. But it's not repentance. True repentance is a change of heart. And changing behavior does not change the heart, for human effort is not enough. Repentance is asking God to change our hearts, and that will change our behavior. So I'm going to read it from four or five different translations. First, the Amplified. So repent, repent, change your inner self, change your way of thinking, regret past sins, and return to God. Seek His purpose for your life so that your sins may be wiped out, blotted out, completely erased, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, restoring you like a cool wind on a hot day. Exit EXB Bible. So you must change your hearts and lives. Repent. Come back. Return. Turn back to God. And He will forgive, wipe out, or erase your sins. Then the time, time, seasons of rest, refreshment, comfort, and the Messianic age will come from the presence of the Lord. Amplified Classic. So repent. Change your mind and purpose. Turn around and return to God so that your sins may be erased, blotted out, wiped clean. That times of refreshing, hear this, of recovering from the effects 
of what you've been going through. Of reviving with fresh air may come from the presence of the Lord. And one more, and I'll leave that verse. Message. Now it's time to change your ways. Turn to face God so he can wipe away your sins, pour out showers of blessing to refresh you, refresh you, and send you the Messiah he prepared for you, namely Jesus. For the time being, he must remain out of sight in heaven until everything is restored to order again, just the way God, through the preaching of his prophets of holy, holy prophets of old, said it would be. Moses, for instance, said, your God will raise up for you a prophet just like me. He did. His name is Jesus. Listen to every word he speaks to you. Every last living soul who refuses to listen to that prophet will be wiped out from among the people. This is more than positive thinking. Some of you are old enough, you'll know why I'm saying what I'm going to say. I find Peel appalling and Paul appealing. Paul does not cha challenge us to optimistic thinking or looking for pie in the sky. Neither did Luke, who wrote his gospel in the book of Acts. They both demonstrate how changing our thinking is beyond what we can do for ourselves. We need God's help with this. We need to start by confessing. I thinking, thinketh, my stink, thinking stinketh. Can you say that? It's hard to say. I thinketh, my thinking stinketh. Well, start thinking a new way. And that's what we're talking about today. Lord, we break the power and the enemy's assignment of stinking thinking that keeps them from rising all the way to the heights that you have for us in life, love, and ministry in Jesus' name. Letter C, step three, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul says, I beseech, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable, reasonable rational service act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. And the only way you can break conform um, being conformed to the world is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need to think different than media thinks. You need to think different than the present political climate thinks. You need to think different than other people in your own home think. You need to think differently than the, work, the way that people think. You need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In, o in other words, renewed thinking leads to transformed living. Our world is full of depressed, worried people, and many are suicidal. I think it was just last Saturday we had our intense training here in the hub, 20 people. All of them that came are strong Christians. And I asked how many of them in the last 18 months have considered pulling into the oncoming line of traffic. Four out of 20 had thought that. What well, would that be, 20%? Did a seminar at Brighton, Michigan at Floodgate Church, and there was 148 people there, and, and just a lot of young people in 20s and 30s and 40s, and yes, people in their 50s are young now. I don't know how that happened. But the lighting wasn't really good, but I asked the same question of them. How many of you have been tempted to commit suicide, drive into oncoming traffic or overdose? And 20, 30 percent of them raised their hands. No wonder God says we need to renew our minds and maybe we need to pray every time we drive. Protect me from those people who want to drive into my lane of traffic. Just maybe. But Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There was never a man who was more maligned, accused, abused, mistreated, victimized, lied about, 
betrayed and slandered than by those who hated him than Jesus. And he was drained by the crowds that loved him. And even those closest to him denied him and one betrayed him. And yet he kept that right mind in it all. Does your mind need renewing? Mine does. And I work mostly with Christians. I don't work with the kind of people some of you get to work with. So how much more do we need our minds can renewed when we're continually contaminated by the world? Let's pause and ask God to renew our minds. Father, we need a renewal of our minds. And we ask for it. We ask that you would change the disposition of our minds, our thoughts, and our attitudes in Jesus' mighty name. Letter D. Step four, let Christ's thinking become your thinking. Philippians 2, 5 to 10. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God, did not consider it um, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. Do you want to be exalted? Humble yourself. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those of earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God's ways are so much higher than man's ways. I need his help in order to think and behave like Jesus. Do you? I need help in loving the sinner and the outcast. I need help loving people with crappy attitudes. I need help in presenting my body as a living sacrifice. Usually our first thought, our first human thought is the opposite of God's. Somebody does us wrong, our first thought is to get, get even. God says forgive. If things are tight, if gas is going on $4 a gallon, our first thought is to withhold giving. God's thought is given it shall be given unto you. Let's pause again. Father, we ask for the mind of Christ to help us think the thoughts of Christ. We ask you to cleanse and sanctify our putrid attitudes and let us truly walk with the attitude of Christ in Jesus' mighty name. Letter E, step five, and what a picture this is. Put a girdle on your mind. When I, when I was a boy, my grandma, who was a fairly large woman, hung her clothes out on the clothesline, including her girdles and other unmentionables. I thought of one of them, man, a pair of pup tents. <laughs> we can camp out. <laughs> she was a large woman. And her girdles, snaps and buckles, I, I just thought, what, what intriguing instruments and contraptions they were. And God says we need to put a girdle on our minds to keep our minds from distraction, from spinning out of control. Had a professor at Spring Arbor College who said that, that this, what he's really saying is we need to put a jock strap on our minds to keep things where they're supposed to be. And maybe we need that. I'm going to give this from a few different translations. 1 Peter 1.13, this is New King James. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Put something around them. Be sober and rest your, your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it's written, be holy, for I am holy. Darby. Wherefore, having girded up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope with perfect steadfastness in the grace which will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. DLNT. Therefore, having girded up the waist of your minds, and that's a really accurate picture because they were talking about pulling up the, the long robes and, and putting a sash around them so you wouldn't trip over yourself if you're going to battle. Having girded up the waist of your minds, being sober, put your hope completely upon the grace being brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I don't think that revelation is limited to the rapture. I think God wants to bring the revelation of Christ to every situation we are facing, don't you? EXB, so therefore, for this reason, prepare your minds for service, prepare your minds for action, to be alert, gird the loins of your mind, have self-control, be disciplined in your mind. All, for all your hope should be for, or focus all your hope on, the gift of grace that will be yours, brought to you when Jesus Christ is shown to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And grace, as I've told you so many times, is God giving you the desire and power, including the desire and power to think the way he wants you to think. So, set yourselves ready, prepare your minds to act, control yourselves, look forward in hope as you focus on the grace that comes when Jesus the anointed returns and is completely revealed to you. Now, just, just so you know that, that the girdle idea isn't wrong, Strong's Concordance gives a phonetic sp spelling, it adds on a numi, which means girdle or jockstrap. To gird up, to gird up braced with a view to active exertion, a metaphor from the girding of the flowing tunic to prevent its hampering one's inactive work. I won't ask you to show your hands, but how many of you would confess to the Lord? The stuff in my mind has hampered me in getting my work done. It's hampered me. Stephen Covey, I don't think he's the first one. I think Emerson said it first. But he said, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Um... Uh, so a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap a destiny. And that's for good or bad. So a bad thought, reap a bad action. So a bad action, reap a bad habit. So a bad habit, reap a bad character. So a bad character, reap a bad destiny. Or the way God wants it to be, so a positive thought, reap a positive action. So a positive or a good action, reap a good habit. So a good habit, reap a good character. So a good character, Reap a destiny, a good destiny. So based on the thought of what the scripture says, we need to start sowing some better thoughts so we can reap some better actions. We need to start sowing some better actions so we can reap some better habits. We need to start sowing some better habits so we can reap better characters. And we need to sow better character and reap the destiny that God wants for us. I really sense it all starts with how we think about ourselves, about others, about our situations, about our work, about our problems. It starts with how we think. And some may need spiritual surgery on their minds this morning. The need, they need the sword of the Spirit to cut away gangrene that has spread through years of toxic thinking. They may need a Holy Spirit boost to move beyond where we are in order to burst into where God wants us to be. And if that's you, God's here wanting, waiting to do that. Just tell Him your need. God, my thinking's gotten out of control. God, I've given in negativity. 
I've allowed anger, grief, excessive sorrow, depression to rule. God, I ask you to do surgery on my mind today. I ask you to change my thinking in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name. Now, if you're ready, please stand for the blessing. In Jesus' name, I bless you. And the Lord Jesus Christ blesses you. The spirit which lives in you blesses you with a possibility and the probability of changing your thinking and having it transformed in a way that will transform your life, your home, your family, your work. Lord Jesus, we confess we cannot do it for ourselves, but you're all powerful. So you can do it. In Jesus' name, I bless you and say he is doing it. Even now, he's doing a mighty work. It's going to spill out of you with happy thoughts, with hopeful thoughts, with encouragement, with confidence. And we bless you in this today. In Jesus' name, amen.